start. So for good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us today in, in this webinar. Right? This webinar is the second webinar of uh, the webinar series that the uh, new Tetaqua is organizing uh, in order to disseminate the, the results, the projects, uh, uh, sorry, the results, the outputs, and also recommendations derived from, from the project. Uh, it gives the, us the opportunity to reach uh, more people eh, that uh, we are able to do it in other dissemination and training activities that the project is organizing, especially in this uh, in this year, which is the last year of uh, New Tetaqua. Eh? So today, the persons that you see in the in the screen is. Uh, well, the coordinators of this uh, webinar series, uh, which is uh, Sihan Zaragoza and Sihan Bari, eh, the two institutes from 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 Sihan, eh, from the International Center for Advanced Mediterranean Agronomic uh, Studies. Uh, you see my colleague from Bari, Giada Menini, and, and, and I, eh, Bernardo Basurco from Sihan Zaragoza. You can see also uh, Enrique Gisbert from Irta La Rapita. Uh, hello, Enrique. Uh, Enrique is the, the leader, the coordinator of the World Package uh, 2. Eh? He will tell you a little bit about uh, this World Package uh, thereafter, eh? because this uh, webinar is uh, showing, uh, presenting to you some of the main results of uh, this uh, World Package. Eh? And also on the screen, you can see the today's uh, speakers, eh? Roberto Pastres from the University of, of Venice. Hello, Roberto. Eh, Margarita Fernandez Tejedor from, hello, hello. Eh, from, eh, from Irta La, La Rapita. Hello, Margarita. Eh? And uh, our invited uh, uh, speakers, not from New Tetaqua, but from uh, the school and other sister project, eh, is Nikos Papandrulakis from the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. Eh? Hello, Nikos. Eh? So uh, the, the title of this uh, webinar, today's webinar, is uh, Promoting Aquaculture 4.0 at Farm Level. Eh? New Tetaqua as other sister projects have uh, worked in these uh, artificial intelligence tools applied for a better management eh? uh, for uh, looking for a more sustainable aquaculture production. Eh? Uh, as I told you, this uh, New Tetaqua is a H2020 project eh? uh, under the program called Developing Competitivity and uh, competitive and environmental friendly European aquaculture. Yeah. Under this program, there the was the call uh, launched in 2018, called Sustainable European Aquaculture 4.0 Nutrition and, and Breeding. And four projects were uh, approved. Yeah. Those were efficiency, efficiency yeah. uh, the one that uh, Nikos Papandulakis is, uh, is a partner of, of it, Aqua Impact, New Tetaqua, and Future e e Aqua. Yeah. Our project, New Tetaqua, mm, is, uh, second, is uh, a project that started in January 2020 yeah, and ended. Uh, is ending uh, at the end of uh, this year, eh, in December 2023. It's coordinated by the University of Bologna. It has uh, 24 uh, partners, eh, 25, sorry. Um, uh, those uh, partners uh, belong to different research and development uh, institutions eh, from, from Italy, from Spain, from Greece, from Norway, from, from France, eh? um, and also it has uh, 12 uh, partners coming from the, from the, from the industry, eh? either fish farmers, biotechnology companies, eh? and three partners uh, working on exploitation and dissemination. Amongst those partners are uh, CGM, 
uh, FEA, the Federation of Aquaculture European Producers, and Green Innovate. Yeah? But the overall uh, objective of New Tetaqua uh, is to expand and diversify aquaculture production of fin fish, mollusk, and microalgae by developing and validating technologically advanced, resilient, and sustainable applications. The project uh, has covered different disciplines. Eh? It has worked on, on nutrition and feeding, has worked on artificial intelligence, uh, new production systems, on, on genetics, uh, new species, mainly reproduction, a development of new products. Eh? Um, it has worked on different species, uh, salmon, trout, sea bass, sea bream, uh, other emerging species like amberjack, migris, or mallet, in mollusk too, and in micro, with microalgae. Mm. And uh, well, uh, now I can pass the word to Enrique, yeah? Enrique Gisbert uh, from Irta La Rapita, the head of the aquaculture program in, in, in Irta, is, uh, as I said, the uh, World Package Leader of the World Package Leader of World Package 2. Um, so, uh, Enrique, please. Thank you very much, Bernardo, and good morning, everybody, for, for attending this webinar. I will make the story really, really short because I think that you are eager to, to hear our invited speakers and and to to hear what they are going to explain us. But this webinar, at the, and in addition, the, the, the work package that I am leading is trying to develop, implement, and standardize precision farming tools that help uh, daily decisions at the farm level. Okay, we know by heart how to farm our fish, we know how to breed them, how to feed them, how to cure them in case they get sick and how to manage our facilities. We have learned this by trial and error during the last years, but now during the last years, there's been a, a new trend, a new, a new movement or a new the technology is helping us to take in these daily decisions. Why by, <clears throat> sorry, by precision farming, by developing models, by developing tools, how we can assist fish farmers or shellfish farmers to conduct their daily routines, they're taking daily decisions and promote a more sustainable, more resilient a topic that is quite uh, common these last days. And at the end, improve the production and at the end, save money. So this is what is about this webinar today, is about how we can different applications, different modeling, different precision farming tools, we can improve uh, aquaculture practices nowadays. For that, we have chosen three talks. The first one is from Roberto Pastres from University of Venice, Foscari, who is going to talk about how we can model uh, inland fish farming activities, especially in ponds, in ponds, how we can monitor uh, feeding strategies with expression, the oxygen consumption of fish, and save at the time money of the fish farmer considering how, for example, feed has to be developed, uh, distributed, sorry, or oxygen has to be introduced in the systems. Then we are going to change a bit. We are going to see how uh, satellite data from Copernicus satellites can help us for planning and managing shellfish farms in shallow environments. You know, shellfish farming is a quite common uh, activity in Mediterranean, or in the Atlantic. So how these satellite images that we use for other purposes, for example, meteorological purposes, can be useful to the shellfish industry. And then the last uh, talk will be from Nikos Papandrolakis from Greece, in which is our uh, co-parallel project efficiency, in which he's going to talk about how fish movement, fish behavior can be used for optimizing uh, managing and feeding practices in our farming systems. Okay, and then we will have a turn of open questions, debate for you to ask questions to our invited speakers. So we want you to, if you have any questions or in doubt, put them in the chat and after uh, hearing know. these three talks, then we will turn on to these questions. Bernardo, please. No, just uh, one uh, very small precision is uh, for questions and answer. 
Uh, this uh, tool, Zoom tool, it has a question and answers tool, eh? and also on a chat. Eh? It's better to use the question and answers eh? because you know, it gives you the opportunity to make your question, and also the speakers may want to answer partially or clarify some doubts. Eh? And, and for us, it's going to be easier to well to follow the discussion that not using the chat although we are being we, we are go, we are going to be looking at the chat eh? but just please go to the questions and answer and and nothing more i, I think that uh, i stop saving and i pass the the floor eh? and the screen to roberto pastres eh? uh, good morning everybody and thank you for inviting me to give this uh, talk in this webinar um, as, as was said, I am working at the University of Venice. I am an um, associate professor in ecology, uh, but uh, I've been doing, uh, let's say, I've been developing modeling tools throughout my academic career. And uh, I also now open, uh, or let's say, um, set up a, a small company to do some kind of technology transfer of these tools. So today I will show you uh, the, Robert, Robert, the, the screen. You have to share yes, the results that I, oh. I, my, with my team, we obtain in the new Tecapa project. Okay, good. Okay, can you can you yes. see it? Yes. Okay, so uh, that's what I just said. And uh, today uh, I will present you some results uh, of new tech aqua concerning the activities that we carried out uh, for uh, conceptualizing and then implementing a model to, and you will see what the model cal cal can calculate to support decision concerning land-based uh, fish farming. We applied the model to Sebastian Sebring and the previous version was applied to trout uh, in a previous uh, um, uh, European project. So first I would like to give you some ideas of what uh, people mean by precision fish farming. It was a concept introduced uh, about five years ago. Uh, and then we go into the, the case study. So the, the, the presentation is roughly divided into, into two parts. So let, let's, uh, let's uh, start. Um, when we are talking about fish farming, we are talking about a framework for decision making that was uh, recently introduced, and of course, uh, uh, it was introduced in relation first to the um, salmon farming sector. What um, we did me with my team was try to transfer this framework to other farming systems, Trout and Inutecaqua, Sebastian Sibrim, which are farm land based. What is the aim of precision fish farming? It's the accuracy, precision, and repeatability of farming operations. You have here also the, the first paper in which the concept was uh, proposed uh, in order to facilitate uh, uh, more autonomous and continuous biomass animal monitoring. This uh, together should give you more reliable decision support and um, also very important for inclusiveness, uh, uh, reduce the dependency on manual labor and subjective assessments, uh, um, which in some cases uh, uh, are still used uh, for decision making. Uh, and if this person that usually take decision for some reason is not there, then there could be problems. And also um, organizing the work according to this new management system should lead to improve uh, uh, staff safety. So um, which are the components of a, a management system based on the precision fish farming concepts? The idea uh, is illustrated by the, um, the scheme that you have at the, at the right uh, on the slides is to monitor uh, types of variables that in this uh, terminology introduced in PFF are called animal variables, meaning parameters related to the behavior or physiological state of, a, of, a, of an organism, of an animal that is being farmed. For example, it could be just the weight, 
that depends on uh, a lot of things, including the feed that you give them, and environmental variables that uh, uh, need to be measured continuously, if possible, with cost-effective robot sensor technology, and uh, could affect uh, the, the physiological state uh, and therefore the animal variable, for example, uh, feed or dissolved oxygen concentration uh, can, uh, can of course affect the growth. Uh, the key, uh, the key component is, is, uh, is the model. The model should be able to predict how animal variables uh, can change in response to external factors that Sometimes you can control, for example, feeding. Sometimes you cannot control, most of the time, probably, in flow-through systems, for example, the, the water temperature. The idea is that the model, when it, these um, drivers that uh, are changing dynamically over time uh, changes, is able to give you some prediction based on the measurements that you're taking and the model. And Therefore, you have a mean of comparing those predictions with what you would do based, for example, on uh, um, feeding tables or your own experience. And then you can take a decision that uh, uh, is informed also uh, by the model predictions. And it could be in this way, let's say, um, more... Uh, um, more in line with what the fish needs. Of course, it's a very challenging uh, and ambitious uh, uh, man uh, management um, systems to implement because uh, we are dealing with uh, a lot of individuals in, uh, in fish farming. And also we are dealing, for example, in cage farming with a complex dimensional environment. And um, in many instances, there are no physical barriers between uh, the farming systems and the rest of the world. For example, if you're taking water from a river and there are parasites in the river water, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to filter them out. That will probably affect your fish, and even worse if you're farming in cages. So uh, it is challenging, but uh, with the the recent advancement and lowering of the cost in sensors that can detect both environmental and animal variables, it seems to be feasible to try to put everything together. So uh, the, 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 the systems should work in uh, the say four steps that are presented here in this circle. Observe, which means monitoring both animal and environmental variables. Interpret, which means uh, using the model to try to see how the fish physiology can uh, change. And then you have decide, making the decision based, of course, on operational experience and uh, what the model says, and then act, taking the final action, which uh, sometimes can be implemented also through the so-called Internet of Things, for example, automatic feeders. So what did we do was trying to implement this approach in a real world fish farm, uh, which it was also very challenging, not in a pilot, not in a lab, and trying to do our best to go through the four steps of fish farming that I just described to you. So just to give you an idea of the case study, the farm is a, a medium sized one, it's located in Orbetello, in the central part of Italy, near a coastal lagoon. The, they produce about 400 tons per year in 42 ponds, concrete ponds. Uh, there are some interesting features about the influent. The influent is breakage groundwater. So the temperature is, uh, it doesn't change a lot during, during the seasons, but the concentration of uh, the soft oxygen is virtually zero in this water. So on the one hand, uh, uh, the, the temperature will be nearly optimal for Sebastian Sebring. On the other hand, uh, there will be uh, quite a lot of money to be spent in oxygenation. And another feature, the, um, 
the flow rate is that is available is not very high, and therefore the the residence times is quite high. It's about half a day or even more. Uh, therefore, oxygen is could become a key parameter both for fish welfare and for the productivity. And uh, to cope with the fish demand, the the farm puts in place, uh, of course, uh, liquid oxygen supply, but also mechanical aerators. So what we did in Utatak, in Utatak well, first uh, we complemented the observing system, the monitoring system of the farm with some new sensors. And those concern the monitoring of some, uh, let's say, uh, fundamental key environmental variables, of course, water temperature, salinity, which does not change that much in this case, dissolved oxygen, ammonia. Uh, it, it was challenging, but also interesting. And uh, uh, pH, because of course, uh, uh, ammonia and ammonium, they have a, a, a weak base equilibrium and it is very important to monitor the pH because if pH goes too high and um, the prevalent form is ammonia, which is far more toxic than, than ammonia. Animal variables, um, here uh, the environmental variables were monitored as you can see hourly, which is also challenging from the point of view of the maintenance of the sensors. And animal variables, unfortunately, could not be monitored with uh, an automatic non-invasive -monit non monitoring systems based on video camera or something else, which can be used in salmon farming. Therefore, we relied on the monthly sampling of the farmer. And of course, we, uh, we, we were full, um, the, the, the company offered full collaboration. So they were, they were very, really, very, very collaborative. And uh, they gave us all information concerning husbandry parameters. We collected quite a lot of data. Um, it was, of course, very uh, challenging for the farmer to do that from July 2020 to August 2020 in four ponds in order to test the model on different size ranges. Uh, I will show you the results concerning only one pond because uh, I, we have to keep this very short. Um, well, I already said that, so I think I can skip it. So this is the kind of conceptual model that then we converted into a mathematical one. Uh, we focus on uh, a pond and uh, we tried to calculate uh, or to estimate from the data the input in terms of matter and energy to the pond. Therefore, feeds, therefore, uh, the concentration, um, the, the water temperature, which is a kind of a driver of the of that of the water and therefore uh, fish that is that is uh, uh, pumped in through these uh, oxygenation systems and of course we took into account uh, uh, to some extent the physiology of fish trying to estimate the excretion of ammonia and uh, the advective terms, uh, the flow rate on the effluent, uh, uh, which is very important to ensure uh, that the water is uh, exchanged and, and that is renewed. So, of course, we, I, we had to simplify to some extent the system, which, uh, even though it seems simple, it, it involves a lot of variables, including, as you are going to see in the data, quite a lot of internal primary production. And we came up with the, the model structure that is depicted in this, uh, in this uh, slide here. So we focus on four variables that we are going to follow dynamically in time, uh, which are the number of stock individuals, the average fish weight, the concentration of the solvent oxygen, and the concentration of uh, ammonia. From that, uh, and uh, taking into account uh, the input in terms of water temperature, water supply, liquid oxygen, and fish feed, we can calculate uh, some interesting quantities that you can see on your right. For example, the total biomass, but also, for example, the uh, oxygen demand and feed demand. These quantities can then be compared uh, with uh, the actual oxygen supply and, and the actual feed ratio that was given in order to understand uh, if it could be to some extent, they could be to some extent uh, optimized. So, of course, the core of that is the, mm, let's say, models that try to mimic fish physiology 
and tell us how the fish can grow based on all these drivers, feed, but also water temperature and concentration of the salt oxygen that is computed by the model. Uh, the model that we use is, uh, let's say, pertains to the so-called scope for grow model. You can find lots of literature and uh, you have a reference at the end, but you can also ask me if you need more, more papers on that. Uh, it is basically an energy budget. We are trying to calculate uh, how much energy is going in, is taken in by the feed, stimulated by the feed, and how much energy is spent uh, in uh, the basal metabolism and uh, other activities, uh, the catabolism of feed, uh, swimming, etc., that is regrouped under this uh, <laughs> term specific dynamic action. So, we checked, of course, the beginning the model parameters because we started for the Sebastian Green model that was uh, published a few years ago that we that we applied to fish cages. We found that it was necessary to correct some of the model parameters, and here you can see the comparison between what feeding table says the dots and let's say the, the function that we devised to calculate the feed demand, the feed appetite. And what CBRIM, we didn't have to do too much. Also, the original function was good for CBAS. So we had to connect and we use the solid line here to assess the feed appetite. We also introduced a new function which relates feed demand to dissolved oxygen concentration. Basically, uh, the feed demand becomes uh, lower and lower as the oxygen concentration becomes lower and lower. So let's uh, have a look at some results that could be assigned to the, um, to the step that we call interpret. The model uh, calculates, uh, I would say fairly well, the, the weight can forecast the weight you can see the solid uh, uh, black line on, on your right. And the dots are the, the weight, the, the average weight estimated by the company based on a sampling of about two to 200 kilo and then the fish counting every month. This is a, a bonding which they were farming in We can calculate, of course, the total biomass and we can calculate the number of individuals. The mortality rate was estimated based uh, on the actual um, initial and final number of individuals that were stocked in that specific pond. In this case, you can see that we, we can match quite well the, the weight from grams up to more than 200 grams, then we also managed to follow another pond in which uh, fish uh, was uh, stopped when it was about 250 grams up to half a kilo. What is interesting, uh, that what information can you get from the model? For example, you can compare uh, let's say the feed demand that is in red with the feed ration that was actually given. Of course, uh, sometimes the farmers see things that we cannot see on our on our virtual, let's say, pond, and decides to uh, stop feeding or to reduce feeding or to give a little bit more based on what he sees. Um, for example, during the first uh, months, uh, apparently he gave a little bit more feed, but sometimes he also he, he also had to stop feeding. Uh, anyway, uh, overall, uh, the model is uh, more or less the correct weight. What does it mean? Since in the model we use, let's say, the feed appetite whenever the ratio is higher, it means that to some extent some of this feed here could have been saved. Otherwise, the model would have overestimated the point. Another interesting thing, uh, dissolved oxygen. Um, we uh, made an assumption, assuming that we can control the oxygen supply. Unfortunately, in the farm, oxygen supply was not Measure with enough precision to give us the possibility to compare these two, these two estimates, and the idea was then to assume that uh, uh, liquid oxygen can satisfy um, a little bit more of the fish demand because you have also advection that brings oxygen out. If uh, you do that, 
uh, you can see the red, the dark line here, you would say around this percentage of saturation, which is within the range that was given for fish welfare in Medate products. The data, of course, these are hourly data, do completely other things, but we analyzed this with Fourier series, and most of this oscillation is not related to fish, but to the primary production in the pond. And of course, to follow this, we would have to make the model, the model much more, uh, uh, let's say, complex. Of course, it would be very interesting to measure the oxygen supply and then estimate the primary production, because in this way, we could estimate within each day which would, which would be the optimal oxygen demand to keep the fish the welfare uh, excellent, let's say, class that is uh, designated between 70 and 100%. So based on that, on this oxygen demand, well, you can also calculate how much oxygen you could have been used to stabilize the oxygen at this kind of level. And uh, therefore, the model gives you the possibility of uh, uh, computing some interesting uh, final, uh, let's say, uh, quantities that uh, uh, you can use to compare with what uh, was what, actually done, and you can use also for planning. For example, you can um, compute uh, the food conversion ratio based on the mod biomass that was predicted by the model, or based on, for example, biomass at harvest uh, and the food feed that was given by the farmer. You can predict the fish demand for the whole uh, period. And this is an interesting aggregated figure that you can compare in this case, that we are comparing in this case with the actual oxygen consumption. We do not have the oxygen that was given every day, but we have an average of the oxygen that was given per ton of fish that you can see down below in the table. And in fact, we found out uh, that uh, uh, our figure, our estimated figure, even assuming that there is a certain inefficiency uh, and therefore not all the liquid oxygen is converted into dissolved oxygen is uh, uh, significantly lower than the amount that was actually uh, given according to the data that were given to us per ton uh, of fish. From the environmental point of view, it is also interesting to compute uh, the total load of uh, ammonia uh, because this is something that, uh, in principle, can produce eutrophication in surrounding water body, and that should give you an idea of what uh, you have to do to, to remove or to lower uh, this input. And of course, you can also uh, take a look at the other one in terms, uh, uh, and, and also compute, compute, if you wish, other quantities that could help in better planning the next move in your in your farm. So. Um, I try to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> so uh, here I have some conclusions, but of course, if you have more questions, we have also plenty of other data that will be displayed uh, in a forthcoming deliverable. And I, I think that it will be a public deliverable uh, and it will be therefore possible for you to look at, uh, I think after the approval of uh, the commission. Um, my conclusion is that, uh, Yes, it is challenging, but uh, uh, it is possible uh, to apply precision fish farming also to sectors which are not as mature as, and as technological advanced as the salmon sector. Um, the implementation, of course, would require some tools. For example, now I know that uh, uh, tools for monitoring biomass uh, fish size, fish weight uh, through video camera are rapidly advancing. With artificial intelligence, you can then uh, uh, try to identify, to correlate the fish shape uh, to fish weight, etc., and uh, analyze the, the images much more quickly than it was possible a few years ago. The grow models, of course, the better uh, information you use as input, the better is the output. And if we would have possibility of using uh, this camera to monitor the weight, we could have come out with better predictions, but the one that we got seemed already pretty good. Um, and of course, uh, uh, if the farmer would have 
measure the more accurately the oxygen supply is something that now they're doing because uh, uh, when we started oxygen and energy were not a big issue now they are <laughs> so farms are getting organized to improve the monitoring as well of course we could have used a data simulation to improve our prediction and also to relate better the the oxygen uh, consumption to the digestive digestion of feed and to the feed rations therefore there are lots of things to be done to improve on that but uh, at the end of the story i think that uh, the target of coming up with a digital twin of a fish farm is not too far away and then of course that will be i hope the next step in future uh, research projects or applications uh, some recommendation um it should be a little bit more if you have never used models maybe you can start looking at them they're not so scary if somebody explained to you the, the basic principle sometimes the math uh, is a bit uh, a bit scary but the, the, the physiology and the, the physical principle on which the models the one that actually are they are not that difficult to grasp and of course, uh, we are also trying to set up a software interface uh, that will produce those results that I show you. Uh, it's all very nice, but uh, having said that, uh, the experience of operators still is fundamental to take the right decision and whatever the model says must be checked. Uh, and and uh, the final decision will always be taken taken uh, based on uh, what one can actually see and based on previous uh, experience in similar situations. So you, here you have some references and of course questions. I will keep looking at the question and answers or maybe at the end of the webinar that there yeah. could be some kind of discussion as far as I could understand. Thank you okay. very much, Roberto, for 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 sticking to the time, for explaining something that is not so evident in a very easy and comprehensive way. And you have your questions in, in the question and answer for, for responding by the text or at the end of the of the session. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bernardo, the floor is yours. Do you want to introduce Margarita or say yeah. something? Uh, well, Margarita Fernandez Tejedor eh, is uh, from Irta La, La Rapita. Eh? You know her better than, than me. Is going to make the presentation about selfish farming in swallowed environments, eh? the use of satellite images for proper management. Uh, I think this, uh, this is a presentation is very interesting, not only for those that are working on selfish farming, but maybe for others that are working in brackets or environments eh? where some of these uh, applications can be also maybe taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Margarita, please. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. You can start. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Marita Fernandez Tejedor. I am a researcher at the Institute for Agriculture Research and Technology. I'm dedicated to the study of the ecology and taxonomy of marine phytoplankton, especially the toxin producing and harmful species, including their effects. Furthermore, I'm implicated in the study of the effects of environmental parameters in fisheries and aquaculture and their application for the management of marine resources. I am concerned and committed to produce high quality results using the best practice in marine research, developing and improving methods to produce consistent marine observations that are crucial to predict changes in the oceans that may affect climate change, food security, and food safety. My collaborators in the development of the results that I am going to show from the new Tecaqua project are Jorge Enrique Velasco from IRTA and Eduard Angelac from the CTBC. The learning objectives of this presentation are to explain the interest for increasing viable aquaculture production, to identify limitations of current shellfish growing areas, to examine different applications of satellite data for shellfish aquaculture, and finally, to estimate current capacity and sustain suitability of shallow coastal areas for shellfish aquaculture. 
Uh, there is a, a mistake in the title of the presentation is shallow uh, areas, not shallow areas. Um, the contents uh, of my presentation, but my, my presentation is divided in four parts. First, I'm going to explain which is the value of shellfish farming. Second, the need for expanding shellfish aquaculture. Third, the applications of satellite data, data for shellfish aquaculture. And fourth, how to overcome the limitations of shallow coastal areas. Showing which are the limitations of satellite data in coastal areas, how to develop the appropriate algorithms, how to apply them in our case to evaluate the suitability and current capacity of the Ebro Delta coastal areas for massive aquaculture. So to start, which is the value of shellfish farming? Bivalves are non-fed aquaculture species. Uh, Bival aquaculture is one type of low trophic aquaculture. Bival aquaculture allows to produce food with a high nutritional value and at the same time provides some ecosystem benefits such as carbon sequestration, nutrient remediation, reduction in eutrophication, coastal protection, and habitat value for fish. The value of carbon sequestration, nitrogen, and phosphorus remediation, and the use of shells of the viable production in the different countries is shown in this map and reaches very high values in China, Europe, United States, or New Zealand, for example. Uh, to maintain or to increase viable aquaculture production, there is a need to locate new coastal areas that are suitable for viable growth. Uh, one of the risks that are at present threatening viable aquaculture are the marine heatwaves. The surface sea water temperature of the Mediterranean Sea has increased uh, 0 0.035 degrees per year during the period 92 to 2001. There are slight differences in the trend among different areas in the Mediterranean. At the same time, marine heat waves are increasing in frequency, duration, and intensity. For example, the anomalies of the average seawater temperature in some in 2000, last year uh, reached 4.7 degrees Celsius in some locations in the Mediterranean. A marine heat wave can be defined using absolute threshold or a statistical threshold. A statistical threshold that has been proposed is to use the 19th percentile of the local sea surface temperature calendar day probability distribution. But we know that the biological responses to marine heat waves occur at different levels from individuals, populations, and communities. Typically, typically their effects are more intense for the species that live at the edge of their warm range. Shellfish aquaculture is often located in shallow sheltered waters, such as the coastal embayments of the Ebro Delta. And now we know that near shore areas suffer marine heat waves that reach higher intensity than the offshore areas. In these coastal embayments, mass mass and mortalities occur during these events of marine heat waves, such as, for example, during the summer 2003 and many other summers since, summer, uh, since then. There is a need to allocate new areas for viable aquaculture. As you can see in the European Atlas of the Seas along the Mediterranean coast of Spain, viable aquaculture is mainly concentrated in the Ebro Delta and the harbors of Valencia. As you can see in this graph, global viable production has increased, but not as much as fish production. More than 80% of the viable aquaculture production is from Asia. Inshore waters have a higher risk of microbial and chemical contamination. These areas are less flush, and then there is also a risk of accumulation of viable depositions. Satellite data has diverse applications for shellfish aquaculture. Uh, satellite data have been used to monitor the spatial distribution of rust over time and space in China. For example, this is an application not for shellfish. This was the shafts are producing macroalgae, but it could be trans used as well as for, for viral aquaculture. Satellite data has also been used to forecast different risks, such as harmful algal blooms in South Africa, for example. Another use of satellite data has been to evaluate the impacts of viral aquaculture, for example, in chlorophyll depletion, 
which can have a positive or a negative effect depending on the intensity, such as the study conducted in Canada. The suitability of coastal areas for oyster aquaculture has also been evaluated using satellite-derived uh, sea surface temperature, turbidity, and chlorophyll A concentration along the coast of Maine. But there are some limitations on satellite data in shallow coastal areas. I am going to show how to overcome these limitations. I'm going to show some examples. But um, through the Copernicus portal, we have uh, open access to products that use satellite data, sometimes combined with modeling and in situ data. One of the products provides a forecast of chlorophyll A concentration in the Mediterranean Sea. But when we zoom to our coastal areas of interest, we can observe that there is no data. There is another product from Copernicus for seawater temperature, which has, uh, has also some areas without data, such as, for example, Fungal Bay. This lack of data may be due to the pixel size or to the lack of appropriate algorithms for these coastal areas. We focused our work in Utecaqua in developing an appropriate algorithm for chlorophyll A concentration in these coastal areas. The Copernicus program launched two identical satellites, one in 2015 and the second in 2017, which have a revisited time of five days. Each one is equipped with a multispectral imager, imager with 13 spectral bands. For the development of the algorithm, we conducted several sampling cruises between September 2020 and October 2021, visiting 20 sampling stations. Water samples were taken and brought to the laboratory for the analysis of chlorophyll A, and physicochemical parameters were measured using uh, a CTD to have the in-situ data. We defined the different areas located at different distances from the bay mouth. Uh, the results of the chlorophyll analysis show a gradient in chlorophyll A concentration from the richer areas inside the embayments to the more oligotrophic areas outside. And afterwards, all, uh, all of the available Sentinel 2 L1C images for the period of, of the study were downloaded from the Copernicus Hub. These are the top of atmosphere reflectances in cartographic geometry for the 13 spectral bands of Sentinel 2. The images were screened for the presence of clouds and shadows. The preprocessing -pro -pre of the Sentinel-2 images was conducted using the graphic processing tool of SNAP and ARCOR. The case 2 regional course color and the C2X complex processors were applied for atmospheric correction. Different bands combination were tested for chlorophyll A estimation. And then several models were developed and tested using different fittings, linear, polynomial, logarithmic, exponential. The entire process was iterated 100 times with varying calibration validation data sets. And for each model, which includes the, the C2 net, the band combination, and the type of fitting, the performance was evaluated by means of the mean average error the root mean square error, the average percentage difference, the bias, and the person size. The best model for chlorophyll estimation was the C2XC processor applying the red one band ratio with a second polynomial fitting. The model showed the best performance since among, uh, among all of the models tested uh, had the lowest uh, errors. We use this algorithm for the series of available Sentinel-2 images from October 2019 to September uh, 2021. And afterwards, we used all of these images to evaluate the suitability and the current capacity of the coastal areas around the Ebra Delta for massive aquaculture. Uh, the chlorophyll A maps created using the best performance model were treated using QGIS, and the monthly chlorophyll A concentration was averaged for each of the areas. The equations of the dynamic energy budget model were computed on Python to estimate massive ingestion rates. 
In these graphs, you can observe the estimated ingestion rates of muscles at different times of the year for the different areas. The highest ingestion rates are observed from October to June and decrease from July to September. The mean ingestion rate values in the external areas were 7.7 .7 in the northern area of the Ebro Delta and 8.7 in the southern area. The numbers one to C, one to, to C correspond to the different areas for the different areas closest to the mouth, to the areas located farther. The current capacity was calculated as the number of muscle drafts that each of the different areas can hold. This number tends to stabilize at higher renewal times. The external areas A3 to A6 from the south can hold between 68 to 96 rafts per square kilometer, while the external areas from the north, F3, F6, can hold between 41 to 60 rafts per square kilometer. The estimated current capacity in the coastal embayments of Alfax Bay and Fangar Bay shows that despite the lower chlorophyll A concentration in the external areas in comparison to the internal areas, the lower renewal times in the internal areas have an important impact in the current capacity for muscle aquaculture. Chlorophyll A images combined, as a conclusion, chlorophyll A images combined with seawater temperature measurements may be used to forecast muscle ingestion rates for the different areas, allowing to run the suitability of them, combining the effect of both factors and identifying the times of the year when conditions are optimal for muscle growth. The highest ingestion rates in the Ebro Delta are observed from October to June and decrease from July to September. The external areas uh, in the south can hold 68, 96 rafts per square kilometer, whereas the, well, the external areas from the north can hold um, a smaller quantity, between 41 to 60 rafts per square kilometer. Despite the lower chlorophyll A concentration in these external areas in comparison to the internal areas, the lower renewal times in the internal areas has an important impact in the current capacity for mass aquaculture. And combining in situ sampling, uh, the sentinel two remote sensing imagery and current capacity models, this can help to expand bival aquaculture to new areas. And as a recommendation, I recommend you to explore the Copernicus uh, open data products that are available and cover uh, large areas of our seas. And then here you have a series of uh, different uh, publications that I have cited and other uh, links to for information. If you have any questions, you can write it in the chat and we, I will reply later. And thank you. Thank you very much, Margarita, for, for showing us how from the space we can support aquaculture practices on on land or on the seashore, okay? So we continue, Bernardo? Yes, uh, good. So uh, thank you, Margarita. Let me introduce Nikos Papandoulakis. Nikos is a researcher at uh, the Hellenic Center for Marine Research, eh, from the center that is in, in Crete and, and Eranclio. Uh, he is a researcher that I know from many years ago has been working on different issues in feeding in behavior also i think that he has done some work on let's say image uh, satellite image and correlation with oxygen maybe in the discussion we can say something about that if if you wish but today he is uh, invited to talk about the some of the results the of their work from the project e e e efficiency okay? The presentation is about tracking and analysis of the movement behavior of European sea bass in aquaculture systems. So, Nikos, you are welcome to take the, the floor. Thank you very much, Bernardo, uh, for the nice words that you said and also for the invitation. Uh, indeed, we have been working together and collaborating in the past uh, with you and some of the colleagues that are here, like Nick. Uh, 
I'm very pleased to, to be part of this uh, uh, webinar and I enjoy very much the presentation both uh, from Roberto and Margarita. We have for sure things to discuss <laughs> during the discussion. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say a few words about uh, myself. I'm research director at the Institute of Marine Biology, Biotechnology and Aquaculture at the Hellenic Center for Marine Research in Greece. And uh, I'm leading uh, the Aquaculture Technologies Lab uh, at the Institute. Uh, uh, we, we have been working the last uh, few years, let's say 10 years, on <clears throat> what we can call the new challenges of the aquaculture. And uh, this includes uh, climate change uh, and also uh, precision farming. Uh, today, I'm going to present you some of the results uh, that we uh, uh, accomplished in, uh, by implementing uh, some trials in the high efficiency uh, project, and in particular, our um, efforts towards an intelligent feeding control system for marine cages. What was the target of our work to provide the kind of decision support to improve the feeding process? And this is because obviously we wanted to reduce the cost uh, during the farming, and that means the food and the energy that it is required, and to reduce waste and general environmental footprint. And this is in order to improve the process planning, the stock and the system maintenance, and to increase productivity and quality. Therefore, uh, for this to be accomplished, we need data. Uh, from fish, equipment, farmers, supplies, uh, uh, production, environment. It's more or less what uh, Roberto uh, described also before, in order to provide some rules. And I'm going to present also this uh, 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 famous, I would say, uh, scheme that uh, all this should be done under a different framework, the precision fish farming framework. Uh, Roberto, thank you very much for introducing the concept before, so I don't have to repeat it again. Uh, the whole idea is that we have to, to somehow to change from an experience-based reasoning on uh, a more systematic and scientific reasoning based on models, uh, 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 numbers that give us the opportunity to describe what we want in a more in in, in a better precision. From the other side, always we need to know that when we implement any, any husband practice, we have to respect the species specific requirements, particularly for fish, to understand species specific behaviors and to respect them, and to respect also the welfare of the fish. And therefore, we shall need and we do need methods to monitor fish behavior without any human intervention, because we know that humans can uh, affect the, the, the behavior of the fish in order to determine the fish requirement and to link these requirements with any husbandry activities that we have. In other words, we need to allow somehow the fish talk to us. We need to find a way to communicate with the fish and to understand their needs. Coming now to this particular question of feeding and the, the actual question is, can we feed smart in the sense that can we consider all the parameters that are involved in the feeding? And these are more or less the parameters that are involved, the environment, the developmental phase, the fish status, and the metabolic state. And if for the environment, we can measure parameters and we have sensors and methods to, uh, to do that. And also for the developmental stage, we can estimate the growth either uh, with models or with uh, uh, machine vision equipment that allow us to, to monitor the, the fish development. And we have also model prediction for the metabolic state of the fish. The fish status is something like uh, more complicated, let's say. And in, in most of the cases, if we don't take fish outside uh, of the tank or of the cage, we are based on behavioral observations. And this is where uh, I'm gonna try to concentrate now in the rest, how we try to, to, to get a better view of these behavioral observations. Actually, what we wanted to do is to use the feeding behavior to achieve intelligent feeding. And the questions we had to answer is, can we, First, the, the basic question is, can we optimize feeding in cages? That means when we can start stop feeding, when the fish are satiated or close to satiation, when the fish are hungry. And uh, in order to answer this question, the, the basic background methodological question, let's say is, can we correlate changes in the swimming activity 
to define sat satiation and hunger level in fish. What we observe during feeding, uh, human observation, and you can see here uh, a, a typical video from uh, a farm uh, of sea bass in the Mediterranean. We see high density. We see a circular motion of the fish. We see an increased activity. And we also see that the fish approaching the sea surface during feeding. And then uh, the next question is, can we define some indicators like the distribution in depth, the cohesion of the group, the change in speed, the directionality and the polarization to, uh, 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 to understand how the fish react and how the fish uh, somehow feel when they are fed. In the eye efficiency, we have developed two methodologies, two technologies, let's say. The fish talk to me, which is a, a technology for continuous data collection on fish behavior with optical system and the integration of these technologies and processing systems for continuous observation. And this is what I'm gonna present you. But also we have uh, what we call the iBOS, which is an intelligent biology online steering system that monitor the fish and their environment and provide us the possibility to act for better husbandry practices. If I, I can give you a, a, a kind of graphical representation, uh, we have uh, the environmental sensors for the water quality parameters. And then we have a combination of tools for the monitoring of, of fish with cameras, echo sounders, telemetry tags. And uh, what we want to do is to investigate the different characteristics of swimming behavior and its variations in relation to feeding, the selection of appropriate parameters to serve as a disease decision indicators, and the quantification of these uh, parameters with thresholds in order to transfer uh, these values to the eyeballs. And you see how the system is. You have the cage, you have camera that observe your fish and all the other equipment that I said. Uh, you collect all this information, you send it to a cloud, and then you have a decision on that and an action on the feeder. How we collect the data? We have a pilot farm at the Institute in uh, Suda Bay in Crete. And this is where we stand. This is Greece, the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, this is Crete where the farm is located. Uh, the farm is located in, uh, in a bay close to a commercial port. Um, the area is semi-protected, quite deep, 100 meters, the average depth uh, in the area that uh, we have the farm. And we use uh, a circular cage of 40 meter in diameter and nine, nine meter in depth. And uh, European sea bass as a modern species. We know that this is not exact representation of commercial farm, but it's a quite close uh, to what is commercial in the Mediterranean that provide us the opportunity to test different things in a pilot environment with different purposes. And the farm is owned by, by the Institute and um, I'm responsible for, uh, for each operation the last 20 years. Uh, how we collect the information? We use submerged camera. We use sensors for environmental data with uh, live streaming. Uh, we use uh, echo sounders, and we use also some uh, telemetry tools uh, to to, uh, to see how individuals uh, behave. This is a kind of uh, graphical representation of the setup. You see the feeder on the top. You see uh, the env environmental sensors in three different depths, so that we are sure that there are no variability because of this. The camera in the middle of the cage the echo sounder at the bottom, and then the wire is transferred to uh, the iBoss to, to any uh, data uh, uh, server that you can accumulate and analyze the data. Uh, a straightforward and easy setup, I would say. There was no difficulties in the installation, and there were no real operational program, problems during the three years that we have been uh, running this, uh, this system in our farm apart from some uh, network failures that sometimes occur related to bad weather conditions. Now I'm gonna show you some results, the, uh, how, how the whole system works in operation, let's say. And uh, first I'm gonna give you an idea of the environmental monitoring that uh, we did. 
we use two different types of, uh, uh, of sensors, of devices, one by OxyGuard and another by BioCyanol. And uh, we have an online monitoring. And as you can see, we have been observing mostly temperature and dissolved oxygen and the pH, because these are the essential parameters for an open sea environment. And we have a direct transfer of this information uh, to, uh, to the IMOS, to the data center. And you can see uh, how in our uh, environment uh, in the, that we have created in the, in the project, how these uh, data sets are, uh, are shown. Uh, coming now a little more to, to the behavioral monitoring. The first thing we did is to, to see how some individuals behave and respond to to the different parameters in the, in the environment of the cage. So we use uh, <coughs> telemetry equipment. We tagged our fish. Uh, we uh, um, put the, the, the tags in, in the fish. First, we uh, analyze the behavior of the fish after tagging to ensure that we are going to transfer the fish at a specific time period that we shall not have any effect because of the implantation, but we are gonna have the, we, we shall monitor the proper activity of, of the individuals. And this is what we came uh, with. This is, we concentrated as, as you understood on, on the feeding behavior. And this is what uh, we came up, that the fish have a food anticipatory activity during morning. If you see, uh, the, the black and white areas in the bottom of the graph represent the night and the, and the day. And you see the green line exactly after the morning that it was an excitation of the fish. And uh, this was continuously. Uh, and <clears throat> this is an anticipation for feeding. Uh, the same, however, was observed not only during the morning, but also during the evening. And you can see this in the graph on the right, that you see the white uh, uh, spots that represent high density of the fish at the upper uh, layers of the cage during the morning, but during the afternoon. And this coincides very well with the known behavior of the sea bass that <laughs> indeed has a foraging activity during dawn and dusk in uh, the natural environment. So uh, we, uh, we have seen that the fish, even in a rearing environment, even in a cage, express this anticipatory behavior, both in terms of activity, but also in positioning in the cage. Also, this data uh, was published a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so they are available and you can, you can find uh, when it is needed. Then we proceed with a more, let's say, complicated uh, monitoring with uh, different feeding schedules. We try uh, hand feeding, we try uh, automated feeding, we try reduced feeding, with, and we try also overfed. Uh, and we try to monitor this, the different behaviors <coughs> according to uh, the conditions that we tested. And you can see here, for example, uh, the speed of the fish in cages according to the different uh, parameter uh, conditions that we test. The, the dust line represents the starting of the feeding. The, uh, the, the green um, rectangle on the bottom represents the period of the feeding. And you can see how the fish uh, react in the different conditions. When they were normally fed, they were anticipating for feeding because they knew the time of feeding. So they have increased slowly their activity. There was a peak by the time that uh, feeding was initiated and there was a gradual decrease. And you can see that it was quite symmetrical, this, uh, this behavior. When feeding was reduced, you see that the fish were quite excited anticipating for feeding because they were hungry, we can say. And then you see that uh, the, the relaxation was not as exactly as was in the normal condition. 
indifference on the overfed uh, case, we have a lower excitation of the fish because they were not hungry and a, a different way of relaxation during feeding. When the fish were not fed at all, then you see that it was quite an abnormal uh, situation that it was not, it, it has nothing to do with the previous conditions. So having this in mind, uh, uh, um, you, can, you, you can see what I've, I've just mentioned in these slides, but we have also seen that there are some uh, limits or some threshold values in terms of the velocity uh, around feeding. So we try to analyze this information and it came that there is a statistical significant difference in uh, the excitation period of, uh, of the fish depending on, uh, uh, on the feeding status. Uh, and you see that when uh, feeding was reduced, the excitation was longer and more intense, while it, <clears throat> when fish were overfed, the excitation was shorter and not at the same extent as the normal or, or the reduced. So this already gave us an indication, indicator that indeed with the excitation, we could understand whether or not the fish are well fed or proper fed uh, and, or not. You have seen also, and I have mentioned that there was a kind of symmetry in the activity of the fish around feeding. And we have tried to, to evaluate this symmetry uh, by doing an analysis uh, that you, I, I, I'm trying to show in this graph. And you see that the blue line represents the normal feeding, and you see that it's quite flat, indicating that uh, there is a real symmetry <coughs> before and after feeding in the, in the activity of the fish. While in the overfed case, the green line, the fish do not have this symmetric uh, behavior. And the same is true also for uh, the reduced feeding, which is represented by uh, the orange line. Uh, the case of the no feeding was quite diverse, and this was also interesting for us because we could now have a kind of variable, this symmetry of the activity around feeding <laughs> that could allow us to control feeding at the end of the day. But we have been going a, a little further, apart from uh, observing the uh, uh, the motion of the fish, let's say the velocity of the fish. So we have been working towards another indicator that it is based on, <coughs> the, uh, on the behavior of the fish. And this was related to the density of the fish uh, during feeding. So we have developed uh, a new variable, a new index that we call the feeding index that allow us to show when feeding starts and when feeding ends. That means, uh, depending on the density and the behavior of the fish, we could show this information. And you see here how this uh, signal uh, evolves, again, <coughs> at, uh, at the different uh, feeding conditions. You see a high step during feeding with uh, this classical behavior of sea bass with a high concentration uh, around uh, uh, the feeding uh, position. And we see that there is this step, this change in, in, in density, let's say, has different level depending on the, on the way we feed the fish. When the fish are reduced, this, <coughs> this index is expressed more and has a, a bigger step when it, it shows, while when they are overfed, this index is quite lower. The most interesting thing is that uh, by uh, performing an automatic clustering of this signal, we came up with these results. And you see that during normal feeding, there are two clusters that represent the feeding period. We have the pre-feeding period, the black one. We have the feeding period, the red and the gray. And then we have the relaxing period, let's say the blue one. And the most important is that when we overfed or when we reduce feeding or with no feeding, these clusters change significantly. For example, in the overfed, you see that the fish express 
this relaxation blue cluster while feeding is still performed. That means the fish are not hungry, but we still provide food. While in the reduced feeding, the fish do express this feeding clustering, the, the red and the gray, even we have stopped feeding. When there is no feeding at all, the fish express this anticipation to food during the period that normally should be fed. And this is another variable that we think that we can control and we give us some possibility to define when the fish are satiated and when the fish are hungry. Because remember, these were the initial questions that we had from the beginning. Now, there is another thing that we, uh, we have done. We use an algorithm to predict uh, a change point detection, as it is said. It's an artificial intelligence algorithm, and it allows us to predict the starting of the feeding just by monitoring this feeding index, and also to have an estimation of the end of the feeding, again, based on this change point detection. This, however, does not, is not, was not sufficient, let's say. So we develop a predictive model, again, using artificial intelligence, to predict how the feeding index would uh, evolve depending on the different conditions, allowing us to advance a few seconds of the real-time measurements. And this give another possibility, again, to control. Because if you, if you can predict how the system will uh, evolve, then you can control depending on what you see. And you see how close the actual behavior, the actual signal and the prediction of the signal is. And we are quite happy with this because uh, this is another indicator that we can finally be able to control uh, the feeding and to, to understand how the feed, how, how fish um, are while fed. So if I gather a little bit what I've said uh, and having in mind if we can control feeding somehow, there are two levels that we can work, the real time and the evaluation and adjustment, evaluation of what has been done today and adjustment in order to, to improve the feeding tomorrow. For the real time, we have these environmental parameters. And you can define thresholds like uh, <clears throat> in, in uh, dissolved oxygen, for example, or in temperature, when you decide or not uh, 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 to feed your fish. And this is a straightforward, direct, real time, uh, decision and uh, control of the feeding. Coming to the behavioral parameters and the behavioral thresholds, I'm just <clears throat> giving you uh, a summary. We have the fish speed, we have the symmetry of the motion, we have a value that a threshold below 0 0.6 body length uh, uh, per second is possibly a, 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 the threshold where uh, everything is finished, the fish are not hungry anymore. And also we have the duration of the excitation. We have this feeding index and we have this clustering uh, comparison and the predictive model. And this provides us another parameter to, uh, to control. And obviously I have to say that things are not as easy as uh, maybe someone can think because you can see that uh, <clears throat> first of all, the signals have a huge variability. All this area around the blue, the the the, the dark blue line, the uh, uh, the shadow that it shows is the variability of the signal, and that means that we require larger data sets. And another problem, another issue, is that we need long-term trials because this information that we have got, we have gathered uh, with a one-year trial needs to be repeated in different conditions, in different uh, life stages, in order to be sure that uh, <coughs> what we are saying makes sense and uh, we can really control uh, the feeding uh, in, in an appropriate way. Uh, a little bit to summarize and conclude what we have achieved. 
we have been able to detect the mon and monitoring the, uh, the activity of European sea bus uh, in cages. The algorithms that we have developed are, have been also tested and uh, are uh, operational for Atlantic salmon. Um, we can automatically detect feeding events, events, the start and the end of the feeding. And we have developed this feeding index parameter that can be used for automatic uh, detection of saturation level. We have the first estimation of saturation level thresholds, uh, and we can define the time when the feeding index decrease significantly. We can also correlate these uh, behavioral parameters with environmental data. And I have to say that, uh, although I, I didn't have the time to, to show these results, we came with very interesting uh, uh, results uh, combining the parameters, having one year uh, environmental uh, parameters, mostly the temperature and also uh, the fish movement in the cage, <clears throat> we came up with a very interesting result uh, on the optimal temperature for the sea bass, which just based on these two variables, the, the motion and the temperature, uh, we came up that around 24 is the optimal temperature for the species, which is significant. We, we know it from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the literature, but we, get, we came up with the same results having analyzed uh, this type of information. And this gives us uh, the hint, let's say, that the type of information that we, we are collecting is, is robust and is, uh, is really valuable. And then, <clears throat> We have, for the first time, integrated fish behavior and environmental parameters through cameras, hydroacoustic, uh, water quality sensors on the common platform. And this is uh, a, real, a real significant uh, step uh, to interpret the fish status and the prediction of their needs. And also, we have succeeded in a kind of deep fragmentation and digitization in a single system. And to our knowledge, there, there is no other current system for cages that integrate cameras, sonars, and environment to leverage uh, predictions. And obviously, this is not uh, and it cannot be a work of just a single uh, person or group. Uh, there are a lot of people that have been involved in the study from uh, HCMR, uh, people from BioCNR, or provide us the sensor and allow us to, to uh, transfer the environmental data uh, to the IBOS. Uh, people from Oxygar did the same with their uh, uh, platform. EGM uh, from France uh, gave us the opportunity to uh, put all this together in, in one framework and to uh, develop algorithms to control feeding. And uh, then uh, our colleagues from uh, Norse uh, has been working with us to analyze the telemetry data and do the trial. I would like to thank you all for your attention. And obviously, I'm ready to answer questions either in chat or now in uh, in this session that we are going to have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Nikos, for, for this nice presentation. I think it's the moment, Bernardo, if you agree to start with the, with the answering. We see that some answers have been already answered through the question and answers space. Uh, but I, I think that we have seen very, very nice presentations about how new technologies, new sensorics can help for taking decisions and can help for supporting uh, current aquaculture practices. We've seen with Roberto how sensors, how measuring oxygen levels, ammonia levels in fish farm, coupled with feeding practices, we can support daily taking decisions in our farms. Then Margarita also show us how data from satellites can help for implementing better managing practices within the shellfish farming. And finally, Nikos uh, provide us a very good example of how can improve feeding, farm, uh, feeding practices with these uh, cameras and sensoric items that they put in their cages. All of us, focus on the same topic, improving the efficiency on the current aquaculture practices. And also with the last, let me say it this way, with the main focus on supporting the industry. This is a very good example. The three of us 
and allow me to, exp to, expand, to expand a bit on that, that how academia can support uh, farms or how can support the companies, because at the end, aquaculture is a business activity and with our knowledge and their collaboration and their implications, we can support uh, this uh, sector and promote their growth, uh, resilience and so on. So if after that, I we think that we may go to, to the answers, okay? Mm -hmm. If you agree, uh, I have a question. I let me okay. So we have a some comments rather than questions. I have a question for Nikos. Uh, you show a very nice presentation about how studying the behavior, how fish swim in the cages. You can monitor feeding and and take decisions. Do you think that the same technology could be used for assessing if your fish? are healthy in your farm, or if they get sick, this behavior will potentially change within the farm? Thank you very much for the question, Enrique. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, the answer is yes. And I'm, I'm gonna provide you a little more with information of uh, uh, what we are doing in the lab and uh, what is uh, the purpose of a new project that we are involved in. Uh, uh, and that we are going to work for the next four years. <clears throat> Our ob objective is to, to provide a kind of more robust information of what uh, we observe normally in the farm, but now with more, uh, let's say, secure numbers and figures. The first thing we, we did <clears throat> was to develop a, a stereoscopic imaging camera that allow us to to estimate uh, the size and the, the uh, yeah the size of the fish uh, without touching the fish without doing any real sample, uh, so we are able now to to monitor the growth and the performance and uh, the the difference in uh, in size um, online on a continuous manner. This gives us the opportunity to analyze images, not like the ones that I have shown you before, but images of one fish each time. And by doing this, uh, yeah, we are able to, oh, yeah. to see also parameters like uh, malformations, mm -hmm. uh, integrity of fins, lack of tail, integrity of tail, how the fins, the pelvic fins or, or the pectoral fins are, uh, how the eye is, uh, the operculum presence and uh, its normality. And this gives us a quite good indicator of individuals. And we can, uh, I'm sure that everybody knows what we call operational welfare indicators. Mm. And what all these parameters that I have uh, described before are part of this uh, operational welfare indicators. And this is a significant part of our work that we are performing now in the Cure for Aqua project uh, that we started working in uh, a few months ago. And we have four years in advance in order to develop these uh, uh, indices, I would say, that allow us this parameter, this, uh, to this tool that uh, will provide us with information. So combining the growth, uh, the operational welfare indicators that are described on the morphology of the fish, plus the uh, uh, the motion of the fish in the cage during the whole day now, and not only mm -hmm. round feeding, this will give us a good picture of how the situation in the cage is. Because as you know very well, in when you analyze, when, when you are on the cage, you can see whether or not your fish are swimming properly, are quiet, or if there are some uh, individuals that are staying aside, they don't move very well, uh, they don't react, or they don't feed, and then they don't grow. Mm -hmm. So if you can monitor uh, these outliers, let's say, in the activity, that you have individuals that they don't perform as the others, then you have another indicator that something goes wrong in your case, and you can get uh, a kind of uh, signal, a signal that go and see what's going there. So I would say, yeah, you have a lot of things to do, 
uh, and we have a lot of things to do now in the next four years. Uh, and obviously, all this, what I've said, is, is mostly related to welfare and not to health. Okay, but okay. health and welfare are very much related parameters. So I, I think that I, I gave you an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Nikos. We are going to follow up what's going on with Curaca, which is going to, to release or to to produce very, very interesting results. Yeah, thank good you. luck with that. Bernardo? Well, I have a, a question for, for Margarita eh, about this uh, work you have done in uh, establishing correlations no, with uh, sensors and satellite images to arrive to recommendations uh, regarding related with carrying capacities. So I think that, that this is very interesting because one of the difficulties that the producers have is this continuous dialogue they might they, they have to have with administrations, no? When they and and they need to to have uh, their demands supported on on events. Eh? So uh, well, this is a comment, but also my, my question is that. Uh, well, you have made uh, recommendations about current capacities, how this uh, production may move based on your results about chlorophylla and temperatures, no? I don't know if you have had the uh, discussions, conversations with the producers and administrations and how, what do you think about this approach? Uh, they find uh, that it's useful, uh, they think that uh, more research is needed to... Yes, uh, well, in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, there has been, um, we have received a request from the uh, northern area to produce, uh, they want to start producing muscles. And in fact, it's a, it's a farm that produces fish. See, uh, it is producing uh, sivas and sibling. Um, they also want to produce muscles. Uh, they are encouraged by the yeah, by the forecast, let's say, uh, of uh, the possible production in these areas, which are have a lower concentration of chlorophyll, but uh, they are high highly fluctuated in comparison to inshore areas. But of course, the, there is always a limit, another limitation that I didn't talk about, which is that uh, there is, um, man it is mandatory to have a monitoring program in these areas that is enforced by the government, by the administration. So uh, in order to, pro to, to produce, to, to start selling the product, uh, it is mandatory to, for the administration to conduct also microbiological analysis, analysis of toxic phytoplankton um, toxins in, in these areas. But satellites can also be helpful for the routine monitoring. Okay. And yeah, and yeah, there is, and the administration is uh, supporting this idea of, for the aquaculture to go to new areas. Uh, it's mainly due in, in, the, in our coast, uh, coastal areas in the Mediterranean, mainly due to the increase in the frequency of marine heat uh, wave events, um, which are occurring almost every summer okay, now. Good. And this reduces also the, the time of the year when muscle production can be, can be done because uh, if te when temperature rises over 28 degrees, uh, we know that muscles are going to, to die in a few days, and the seed for the next year is going to die too. So new, yeah, there is a need, an important need to start viral aquaculture in new areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, continuing with this, I have a, a question for you that maybe can be extended to, to Nikos. It's about, you have tried to, to look for correlations between oxygen eh, and the satellite the images. Eh, because I think that Nikos, they, they have a work about this on, on cages. Eh, 
but on these solid environments that you are working on, I, I don't know if there are those correlations have been already tested. Uh, Margarita? Yeah. And then uh, we haven't uh, tried to find correlations between oxygen concentration uh, and satellite images in our coast. I know some work done in other parts of the world uh, based on uh, chlorophyll concentration and seawater temperature, but we, we haven't tried in our in in our case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to to come to make this question exactly the same question to Margarita because uh, <clears throat> the, obviously the correlation with the oxygen is very important both for bivalves and also for fish. Uh, and answering a little bit to what Bernardo uh, asked, we did uh, develop a model <clears throat> for uh, estimating uh, the oxygen concentration in the marine environment uh, based on, as Margarita said, on uh, temperature and chlorophyll data. Uh, it's, uh, we, we trained uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm to, uh, to, to to analyze the data that we get from Copernicus. And we did test it in different uh, environments on, in Greece, uh, in uh, the north of Aegean Sea, in, uh, uh, in Crete, and also in the West Coast. The truth is that we have not tested it in environments like uh, um, deltas and so on. So we don't know how it's gonna be. I'm sure that uh, I'm almost sure <clears throat> that if we calibrate properly the model, then we are gonna get uh, interesting results at least. And <clears throat> a question that is significant and I would, would like to ask Margarita is, what was the spatial analysis of the data that you have been using? Because one of the major issues that we faced was the downscale of uh, the Copernicus uh, <coughs> images to the scale of the farm. Because yeah, Copernicus give us uh, rectangulars of uh, kilometers, but the farm at the end of the day is a little more uh, short, let's say small. And if we speak about cages, then we speak about tenths of meters. And this was a significant issue that we have to develop algorithms to downscale a little bit the information <coughs> that Copernicus gave us. And all this is published in another paper that. Uh, I can provide <coughs> to anybody that it is interesting by sending just me a mail. And that, this is what I want to ask Margarita. Well, the, the good thing is Sentinel-2 for chlorophyll has, uh, yes, the resolution is uh, only, don't remember, but a few meters. Uh, then we could quite well, uh, correlate the, uh, our sampling station with the image. The, uh, we had to, for, for the area, our area of study, we had to download four types to cover the whole area. Um, yeah, the, the good thing is that for, at least for chlorophyll, the resolution is very good. Good, mm, excellent. And yes, it's not the same um, for other parameters and uh, for the, yeah, but for, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, just to add one more thing, uh, in our work that we did uh, uh, using this satellite imaging, we have been using also drones to, to downscale uh, the analysis and we use imaging uh, with uh, appropriate cameras on the drones to get the information that Copernicus give us, but at, on the local scale, that give us the possibility even to go on the cage level, let's say, and uh, not only in an area. So it's uh, the resolution is uh, in, in terms of meters. Thank you. In this end, we have a question in the in the question and answers from Mohamed Rabdi that asks you, Margarita and Nikos, if this Copernicus could provide data from inland areas like salt, saline lakes, or dams. So if you can provide an answer, yes or not, or? Yes, in fact, Sentinel-2 was more uh, uh, dedicated to land agriculture than to marine areas. 
yeah, it, it covers that. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Roberto. Okay. Uh, with the data and the models that you have showed to us, have you tried to make an estimation of the savings that they that may represent the implementation of those systems for the fish farm in terms of oxygen or feeding or whatsoever variable that is included in your model? Uh, yes, we are doing that. Uh, we are more uh, oriented towards, let's say, the environmental benefits. As you know, we are involved in World Package 6. We talk about uh, uh, the potential environmental uh, uh, improvement uh, brought about by no new Takakwa innovation. And um, there is a clear improvement in terms of environmental impact, but, but also of cost. Um, if the the farm would uh, uh, implement uh, a better control system for uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, exploiting also the primary production which is uh, occurring, because uh, they could try to modulate the the oxygen supply, but also the aerators that they are using in accordance with the time of the day in order uh, to use them mainly overnight when the, 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 the primary production is zero and also the, the, the algae consumes oxygen and uh, lower it the, during the day. Um, we also found that uh, in, in some instances, for some reason, the, the, probably they were overfeeding the fish a little bit, and and therefore uh, the comparison that I show could be could be useful for quantifying the, the the potential saving. This is why, as I showed in one of the last slides, we are now calculating some global, let's say, cumulative quantities for uh, an ideal uh, um, for an, an, for farming an ideal cohort for the growth stage that could give us the possibility of uh, calculating the total amount of feed, the total amount of oxygen, the total amount of ammonia that uh, would be released, just to give an idea uh, and to compare this data with the, the data that uh, we are using in the life cycle assessment. Because in the life cycle assessment, we are using data which refers to the average yearly production. Here we are looking at some ponds, and therefore we have to try to reconcile the results of the two analyses to come up with some uh, meaningful results in the end. Mm -hmm. So you will see some results in uh, the deliverable concerning uh, World Package 2 and some in World Package 6. Mm -hmm. uh, Enrique, the microphone that I was just saying, sorry, that this information is going to be on the webpage of New Tech Aqua Project because most of the deliverables are public and are published there, okay? Just for, mm -hmm. for those that are interested in those results. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I have a question. If, if uh, I may reply to one of the questions that was in yes, yes, before where, where uh, uh, a participant was asking about the model availability, of course. Uh, um, there is always a gap between the model that we are using now with an R, an R code and the model that could be used by, let's say, a farmer. The gap uh, is uh, something that uh, communicates between the two and makes the model easier to use. Of course, uh, uh, we are going to develop in new tech up by kind of prototype uh, of a user interface with some minimum functionality to show how the model works. But then uh, uh, there is quite a large investment in converting uh, this, let's say, prototype, this demonstrator into a professional interface. And of course, this will be part of uh, the exploitation of the project uh, rather than the project itself. So, but of course, the equations will be public. Uh, and uh, anybody could uh, redo the model if you want, if or she wants. <laughs> okay. So I, I have a question for for you, Roberto. That maybe can be extended to uh, to to Margarita and Nikos thereafter. The this is related with the work that you have done, where you are modeling no, the the reality and working with many parameters uh, in order to to propose a better management. Uh, 
we, we all know that the modeling is, as you have explained, doesn't take into account the whole reality, but it helps us to understand the, the reality. Um, one, one of the things that help us uh, modeling is not also to do a better, let's say, management, uh, production management, but also to take into account the uh, risk and be prepared for events. Eh? And then my, my question is, uh, you have examples about uh, how your uh, models or can help us to producers to be prepared more against uh, risk events or events that uh, may need the predictive uh, management decisions. Yeah? Uh, um, to some extent, I would say, uh, for example, uh, when Margarita was quoting the heat waves. Uh, heat waves, heat in a particular place, or Betello a few, year, a few years ago, and they, they expense in particular in the extensive uh, part of the lagoon in which they, they carry out a kind of extensive farming. They have large, uh, a lot of fish die, died with uh, uh, huge cons economical consequences. Of course, uh, um, you may not be able to, to do a lot against that, but if you have weather forecasts for this kind of land-based systems in which you have very high correlation between water temperature and uh, atmospheric temperature, if you're taking the water, for example, for, from the lagoon or or in a, in a case system in which you can observe the temperature and make predictions, you can try to anticipate what may happen, a harvest a little bit, or a harvest whatever you can, <laughs> before you, you get to, uh, the full uh, heat, heat waves. The same story, I think, also for masses, because uh, I've been working a little bit also on muscle uh, modeling. And uh, the model can also be used for anticipating the risk of hypoxia. Um, I, we did that for in, in a previous project for droughts, for example. In that case, um, the, the farms uh, was fully equipped uh, with uh, uh, system monitoring the oxygen supply, so we were able to to get on, on real time information on the on the oxygen supply, and from them we could calculate uh, with rather high accuracy the dynamic of the feed oxygen demand that was clearly shown in the in the uh, in the nikos um, presentation the change in activity when they fish eat and of course you can add the change in oxygen consumption when they digest the feed and therefore you can anticipate uh, uh, and predict with two or three hours ahead the, the oxygen level. And of course, if you can see something critical going on, uh, you can uh, decide to act, stop feeding or do something to avoid that the oxygen goes to a very low level. So that, that can be done with this kind of tools. Uh, if in particular they are um, complemented, but by the kind of monitoring systems that were presented uh, in the last talk, um, and uh, hopefully there will be some uh, kind of cooperation or collaboration among that. I'm sure that also Nikos group uh, are developing models similar to the one that I show. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, uh, the case is exactly as you described. Um, we have been uh, developing models, not similar. We, we are mostly working with uh, dynamic energy budget models like the ones that Margarita presented. Uh, but nevertheless, we have models that predict uh, uh, oxygen consumption and growth. And in fact, in this uh, Cure for Aqua project that uh, I mentioned also before, um, we are trying to develop algorithms that can predict the oxygen con concentration uh, in a couple of days ahead of what's going on today. And this is what we are doing with the BioCyanor group that uh, Antonio Verti uh, sent the mail before because we are colleagues, also colleagues and partners in this, uh, in this project. Now, <clears throat> based on this future prediction and uh, having a complete, a complete analysis of uh, uh, the environment, including uh, currents and so on, we can <clears throat> estimate oxygen demand based on the size of the fish, the number of cages that you have in the area and so on. And you can decide whether or not you want to feed at all the next yeah. day 
based on the environmental parameters. It's exactly what Roberto said, but in a different environment in the sea, which is a little more complex. I mean, in yeah. the land-based facility is more or less allowing the world in control, although it is not, but it's, it's a little more, uh, let's say, uh, known the system. While in the sea, you have a little more parameters that you have to play, and you have less parameters that you can control. Yeah, I mean, you, can, you cannot add oxygen, for example. You you don't have this opportunity. You're, you Some of farming, they try to do it. <laughs> Indeed, but they lose a lot of money. But <laughs> ne never mind. Uh, I mean, we are all working in the same direction, and uh, <clears throat> the modeling is exactly as Bernardo uh, said. It's not the reality, but it's a tool to analyze what is going on and give you ideas of how you can avoid critical situations. Yeah. And the more complex and the more uh, representative the models are, the more close to the reality are. I mean, yeah. uh, Roberto in his presentation introduced the concept of digital twin. And uh, this is another important parameter. We would like very much to have in our computer everything and know how a farm is operating and how a farm is, is working and see a couple of days ahead. Another important thing, if you allow me to, to continue just for one line, is that models give us the possibility to predict a little ahead in the future. And now having this climate change problem crisis in front of us, this gives us the opportunity to predict how the situation will be in different farms and in different levels. Yeah. And this is a very critical and very important topic that only models can provide. Only with this tool, we can see what's gonna be in 2030, 2014, 2050. There is no other possibility for us to predict that long in the future and take decision whether or not an area uh, that we have uh, our farm is appropriate for farming in the next 20 years or not. So indeed models, it's something that we need to, to use. I agree with what Robert said that we should not be afraid. The numbers are, very nice things. <laughs> it's uh, actually, it's the only way that we learn the truth. <laughs> if we have numbers, we can be accurate. So the more numbers we have, the better for all of us. And this is our uh, purpose because all, uh, be behind all this aquaculture for story to get numbers and not only observation. Well, they are okay. They are good. It looks nice. They are big, they are growing. No, <clears throat> they are good because they are swimming with 0 0.3 body length per second, full stop. <laughs> and I know that Margarita is agreeing with what I'm saying because <laughs> I see her laughing. And this is the whole purpose of the whole story. Get numbers because they are sure what you are doing. And sorry for being, uh, yeah. <laughs> say, say uh, I word. agree. Uh, we have developed also models for cages. So they are the same that we apply, we are applied here. And uh, of course, it's very important to, to to apply them for cages. And then I also use the Copernicus to correlate uh, sensor data to Copernicus data. And then from Copernicus, you can get the eight days ahead prediction of a lot, a lot quite a lot. That would also uh, answer to some extent to your questions. I did something like that. I got the data from the farm, uh, dissolved oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. I correlate them with Copernicus. And then I use the Copernicus uh, forecast to do some forecasting uh, for the farm for those kind of conditions so that this is the, the way that i think we are all going <laughs> trying to 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 integrate the information from different sources to come up with better prediction and then use data simulation in my case in your case artificial intelligence to to come up with reliable predictions okay thank you very much for this productive sharing of ideas and expertise, Margarita, yeah. Nikos, and Roberto. It's been very nice seeing that even from different areas of the Mediterranean, from different parts of the academia and research institutes, we share ideas, we put in common our expertise and practices for, for a final similar goal. So it's very, very nice to see how converge all these inputs and all these efforts. I don't know if you want to say some Closing words, Bernardo? Not very much. Just to remember, well, first to thank all the participants, the attendees to follow us, 
to let them know that the recording of this uh, full webinar is going to be uploaded at the New Tetakwa web page where they can also find more information about the project, deliverables, the recordings from previous uh, uh, webinars, uh, publications, um, to invite them to, to follow to the forthcoming seminars, webinars that are going to start uh, after the summer, uh, beginning of uh, September. Uh, to the guest speakers, to thank them for contributing to these uh, webinars. And just a very short comment to the last question, comment of Nikos when he said that we need numbers, just to tell him that also we need feelings, eh? but feelings that can be correlated no, with, with numbers, eh? not with <laughs> Just that. Eh? So is uh, well as I said that we finish here, and we invite you to the following webinars that will come after the the summer. We will announce them probably beginning of September. Eh? Thank you very much for for all, and and that's all for for today. Eh? A big thank to Enrico for coordinating the discussion and all the. Ah, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> thank you. Very nice to talk to you all and to answer, try to answer to the participant questions. Thank you, Roberto, thank you. Nikos, Margarita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Margarita. It was our pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Cheers. <laughs>